just a quick hello from me um, to introduce this session. Um, I think this is the fifth uh, journal club event we now run, so uh, welcome all. Um, and uh, Chrisia is going to be chairing this evening's uh, session, but I'll also be here in attendance. Um, there's a few questions in chat I may have to uh, respond to in a sec. Um, but I'll let uh, Chris here introduce this evening's session. Um, although it's a great pleasure to have with us um, Caroline Hurst and Laura Crane, um, both of whom I've known for some time now and uh, um, had some good debates with over the years and so I'm looking forward to another one this evening. Um, and a very important topic area however tonight and the kind of work um, that's being discussed um, in terms of post-diagnostic support and practically helping people and uh, analyzing that and recording it in terms of research articles as well so the the combined efforts here uh, i think to be um sort of highlighted as a, a really good uh, things for us to influence others um and a way of working which can potentially have uh, practical impact down the line despite some of the barriers we face with this kind of work as well which is something I'd like to discuss later on. Over to you Chrissia um, to introduce tonight. So we have Dr Laura Crane and Caroline Hurst joining us today which is fantastic. So just to give them both a brief introduction. So Laura is a researcher at the Centre for Research in Autism Education at the UCL Institute of Education. Laura's research focuses on addressing inequalities that autistic children, young people and adults face. And Caroline has trained as an art psychotherapist and self-identified and achieved a diagnosis of autism in adulthood after years of personal therapy. And Caroline now works at Autism Matters and is also the founder and director of Autangel, a community interest company run for and by autistic adults. So at this point, I'm going to hand over to Caroline and Laura. The stage is yours. OK. Um, well, uh, OK, I'll um, sort of begin, but please chip in, Laura, as and when. So I first met Laura when she ran a conference on diagnosis, was it diagnosis or post-diagnosis, autism diagnosis? What was the title of it? I think it was something like um, autism diagnosis making voices heard. Oh yeah, yeah, that's right. And so I wrote a somewhat um, critical email saying, well, you've only got one actually autistic voice. and but Laura, unlike a lot of people in this situation where they're sort of criticized, wrote back a very pleasant, nice, warm email. Um, and I, um, I went to that actual conference and I talked to Laura about a program that I devised and couldn't get anybody to fund to, um, sorry, I'm finding this a little bit difficult because I'm used to being able to see the participants and I just, I'm talking to, Laura here about something that she knows and I can't see anybody else so I'm just sort of uh, I'll talk for a bit and then I'll let Laura take over because um, I'm not very good at doing this. Um, so I had a, pro a program that at the time I called a post-diagnostic program that was for um, for people who had it to come after an autism diagnosis um, and enable people to understand it or understand what that might mean for them. 
Um, and this just struck me as an obvious thing, as somebody who'd been diagnosed late and also who had trained in psychotherapy and had a lot of psychotherapy and nobody picked up that I was autistic and I had to figure it out for myself. Um, and I just personally got the diagnosis as a way in, as an entrance to a group that existed in the city that I lived in um, that was a peer support group. Um, and there were various, uh, I mean, it was great to have a peer support group, but there were various issues with the fact that there wasn't a particular structure for it and it was suitable for some people and not for others, etc. So as I was at the time um, working in mental health, providing training, I thought, well, A, um, therapists and mental health workers need training about autism, but also people who get a diagnosis need to not just be given a diagnosis and left sort of at the edge of the cliff with that diagnosis. And so I developed this program, um, but I couldn't find anybody to, um, to finance it for a long while. And so talking to Laura about it, she agreed at that point to, uh, to do some research into it and even to try and help, I didn't really realize the way that research worked. I thought that maybe it could be called a research project and that could fund the work itself, but I learned that it didn't work like that. But eventually we did get funding and Laura very kindly um, agreed to evaluate this so that we could have some evidence that it was, at, if it was in fact useful, we would have evidence to show that it was useful. And what was what I loved working about Laura, about working, with Laura was it was truly collaborative. And I just feel that that's the way that it should go for um, research in autism, ideally would be driven by the needs of autistic people rather than the interests of researchers. And that is what happened here. Like Laura just um, discussed things and it felt like an equal partnership. And she was also open to meeting the participants so they didn't feel like lab rats being you know examined by somebody else so she was willing to meet them as human beings and I just feel that is so important in research so I could at a later stage if people are interested say something about the actual content of the program but I think that's what I'd like to say for now about the um, research process really yeah and um... I remember getting that email um, <laughs> <laughs> and I mean ultimately you were completely right um, and I'm really glad actually that you did get in touch because it made me reflect a lot more and I remember thinking to myself I'm not going to make that mistake again and we worked together on another um, event um, where you were kindly advising and I think we had a majority of autistic speakers at that one a few years later. Yeah which is really nice. Um, but the event itself, it was great to get to meet Caroline because I, at the time, was doing some work around autism diagnosis. And in particular, I was doing some kind of survey work and some interview work, looking at people's diagnostic experiences and where things were going perhaps a little bit wrong. Um, so I was doing some work where autistic adults were talking a lot about how difficult it was to get a diagnosis. Often the fact that they realised they were autistic came from maybe years of going through mental health clinical pathways before someone first realised or mentioned that perhaps autism was a kind of category that better fit um, or from the person's children being diagnosed as autistic and then that led to them perhaps seeking a diagnosis for themselves um, but even if someone did identify that they might be autistic that process took a very very long time and was very very difficult and people went through um, that process the word fight often comes up a lot and I think the perception is that you fight to get a diagnosis and then when you get them when you get your diagnosis actually that's when you know it's a passport or a gateway to help and support and actually what we were seeing from our work was that that wasn't the case at all there was very much a postcode lottery of provision if things were available they tended to be quite short-lived or there was long waiting times for them um, and that's if there was any support available at all um, 
And many people spoke about if they did access um, post-diagnostic support, often it wasn't necessarily a very positive experience and they were quite dissatisfied with it. Um, many people, one of the themes that came up in our research, many people spoke about being what we call dumped and directionless. So you get your diagnosis and then, you know, you're left to kind of work out what that means all by yourself. And often through the diagnostic process, it was quite a negative experience as well. There was a lot of focus on the challenges of being autistic, um, as opposed to some of the more positive aspects as well. So there was all of these issues that we were seeing in our work and meeting Caroline and hearing about this program that she wanted to run. It just seemed to address so many of those problems. So I think, it wasn't the case that my work led to Caroline setting this up more than we we both kind of identified that there was an issue and we happened to come together in the right place at the right time. And our work um, came together really well and I'm really glad it did. Um, so we started working together to evaluate the programme and as Caroline said, it was a very collaborative process. So I think if Caroline would have said to me, come and evaluate this program, I probably would have designed it in a very different way. And I don't think it would have been as good. Um, so the, the approach that we took was very much, um, I think just a, a very kind of respectful and accessible way of evaluating the program in lots of different ways. So. Um, Caroline suggested that we did, um, we analysed some initial um, questionnaire information from people about why they wanted to attend the programme and that I had a conversation with them almost straight after they finished the programme and again six months later so often with these kind of evaluations what you might see is lots of questionnaire measures of mental health or autistic traits and things like this and that wasn't the approach, it was very much, tell us about your views on the program, um, the impact it had on you, but also what you thought worked well and what could be improved in future. And we did that straight away and again, six months later, to see kind of people's reflections once they'd had a little bit of time to take on board everything that they'd learned and all of the new information that they'd gained to, see the impact and um Karen, i don't know if you want to talk a bit about what the program itself is like or what it comprises before we kind of talk about more about the kind of results as well yeah sure um so there's one thing i want to say though that what the sort of concept changed a bit over time from when it first started it was called the post identification program um, and it was post diagnostic was how I was trying to sell it and it was almost like people who are newly diagnosed or newly identified but actually we realized the newly was redundant because people hadn't had this if they hadn't had it six years ago it was still useful for them to understand um, what autism meant in their lives um, as well as for people who've just been diagnosed. So currently um, it's basically open to anybody who self-identifies um, or is diagnosed as autistic. And even that original one, although it had the title um, that implied somewhat that it was just for people who were newly identified, some people had in fact had a diagnosis a while back and there was a mixture of people who weren't diagnosed um, who subsequently got diagnosis. So that's just a bit of background. So essentially it's 10 weeks and the aims, I'll just read what, what it says the aims are, to learn about autism and discover if how it affects people personally, to process, and this was the most important thing, uh, was to process the emotional response to identification and diagnosis. Um, and to consider um, the pros and cons of disclosing autism 
and develop strategies to capitalize on strengths and mitigate challenges associated with aut autism and to socialize with peers. And really the thing, the overriding thing was like to normalize being autistic. So I used to call it autism positive, but basically to me it's autism neutral. So autism is just a form of neurology that's part of humanity and it's not intrinsically better or worse than another neuro neurology, but, but we need to understand it. You know, we need to understand our limitations and our strengths, and we're just gonna be banging our head against a, a brick wall if we think we're something we're not, which most autistic people are, um, are trained to do by the assumption, if they, if they don't have a diagnosis, the assumption is that they're non-autistic. Like people will, quite readily tell you, oh, I'm not autistic. And then if you say, oh, I am autistic, they'll say, have you got a diagnosis? Well, why do I need a diagnosis more to be autistic than they need a diagnosis to not be autistic? So what, so the relevance of this really is that within the group, even things that people maybe had heard about or knew when they would meet with other people, and be talking about autism relevant topics and discover that they weren't the only person who'd gone through that. That made a lot of difference. So um, yeah, so the, the weeks, um, so essentially we just sort of go through, we start off with an overview of autism, how it is seen in society and how we would like that to change. Um, and then we talk about specific traits, if you like. So, so we go through sensory issues, executive function, um, social communication, and um, we do talk about theory of mind, which I have always thought was a misnomer, but definitely the way in which autistic people, um, to me, intuit other people is different to the way in which non-autistic people do that but it isn't really about theory, would be my take. So, and we talk, yeah, so there's that. Um, we look at emotions and empathy, the social impact of autistic traits and mental health and assertiveness. And then we talk about disclosure, the pluses and minuses and where to from there. And part of, we're sort of a bit careful about the end like Autangel, which is the organization that runs it, has got peer support groups, but they're very different in feel to this quite intensive 10 week course where you've got the same people each week. So the peer support groups are drop-ins. So people often find um, that they become very attached to, uh, to the people within that 10 week program and are sort of a bit concerned about how they'll manage afterwards, which was one of the reasons why we wanted to get this six month review to see if, um, if it was okay and if it had still been useful without the ongoing discussion and reflection back. Uh, do you think that's, have I missed out any vital points or does that more or less cover off, do you think, the course? Yeah, no, I think that's um, perfect. And oh, just to mention though, so in the paper, this program was face to face. Um, oh yeah, that's right. But actually it has gone online since, so that might be something we can talk about a bit later. But it, it was um, face to face, so everyone was kind of from um, the local area or fairly, you know, within commuting distance from there. Um, and I got to come down on the last session of the program and to meet everyone. So this was something that Caroline suggested, which I think was really, really helpful as well. Um, so everyone got to meet me. I kind of came along and introduced myself and everyone had the chance to ask me questions about myself and my research. And I think that was really important in terms of kind of level in the power balance a little. I was about to talk to each person and ask them lots of questions about them and their background and their experience of taking part in this program. So it was an opportunity for them to kind of get to know me a little bit better and feel a bit more comfortable before they come and took part. Um, and I got to come and have pizza with everyone, which was really nice as well. Um, 
but yeah, as Caroline mentioned, we, um, so I came down and I had some kind of questionnaire information from people um, beforehand. And what we'd asked them about was their motivations for attending. And we looked at this information and there was kind of three key reasons people mentioned to us about why they wanted to attend. So our first reason we termed exploration of autism. So people just wanted to come and get a better understanding of autism as a kind of general concept, but particularly in relation to themselves. Um, some people had already done quite a lot of reading and learning about being autistic and wanted to kind of consolidate that. Whereas as Caroline mentioned for other people, it was very much, I'm not sure if I'm autistic or not. And I want to kind of better understand if I need to, or if it would be worthwhile for me to go and access a formal diagnostic assessment. Um, so that was one key reason people attended. Um, the other thing people mentioned, um, we termed empowerment. So it was wanting to um, feel empowered and feel accepted. And lots of people mentioned things like, you know, meeting other people like me. Um, and I think linked to that was this desire to kind of explore more positive aspects of autism relative to those that they encountered through the diagnostic process or through other things that they'd heard about. And then the third reason that came up quite strongly through the questionnaires was that people wanted to come on the programme to develop practical strategies and coping mechanisms. Um, they wanted, you know, lots of people kind of had mixed emotions around what it meant to be autistic. And that could have been from the diagnostic process itself um, or through difficult experiences that they'd had in their life. So they kind of wanted to work through that. Um, and just, you know, if they'd encountered difficult situations in daily life, what kind of strategies can I employ to support myself? So they were the three reasons that we identified beforehand about why people wanted to attend. And then I spoke to them after, so straight away and again, six months later, um, and I should mention as well, this was actually across two iterations of the programme. So there was one group who took part and I had the questionnaires. I interviewed them straight away and six months later. And then a completely another group um, who did the same. But actually, it was the findings were very, very similar across both of those iterations. So we kind of analysed them all together. And interestingly, um, we are evaluating the online program at the moment and we are seeing quite similar things come through as well but I'll just talk through each of the kind of there were three themes that we identified from our data and Caroline feel free to kind of jump in I'll kind of stop at the end of every theme if there's anything you wanted to mention um, but our first theme that we identified was that the people who took part really appreciated the autistic led nature of the program um, and it was right, quite interesting actually, because some people didn't know that the program was organized and led by an autistic person when they initially signed up, but it was only after they'd attended that they realized actually the benefits of that. And that was seen to be a really, really positive aspect of the program. So even people who said, you know, I would have taken part in a group if it wasn't led by an autistic person, kind of ended up going away saying, you know, actually I do, if I could pick, I would have a preference for the facilitator being autistic. And the kind of um, things that people mentioned was it led to feeling very safe, um, a lessening of judgment, um, and they just felt really, really comfortable there. And actually, although I, you know, some people, um, didn't know that Caroline was autistic um, or were kind of not too fussed either way, at least originally for some people, actually it being autistic led was a really, really key reason for attending and they wouldn't have attended if it wasn't led by an autistic person. And something that came up a lot as well was the fact that the Exploring Being Autistic program was seen as quite a welcome contrast from some perhaps less positive experiences 
with non-autistic professionals in the past. And the kind of terms that people used to describe those interactions was things like, you know, feeling scrutinized, feeling intimidated, um, and it sometimes being a bit soul destroying. Um, and I don't, you know, I'm sure that professionals who are leading these kind of programs, there can be some that, you know, are very, very effective, have a very positive um, perception of being autistic, but there was a sense from our participants that actually it was, some of their previous experiences were quite negative, were quite medicalized. And certainly that was something that came out from some of our previous work around autism diagnosis. And interestingly, we spoke to professionals as well as part of some of our earlier work and they did acknowledge the fact that it was important to focus on the positives and felt that they did, but did talk about how that was very difficult because the medical kind of framing of autism is all around the negatives. Um, so certainly quite a contrast there in terms of this group being autistic led relative to um, previous programs. Um, and Caroline's um, facilitation skills were something that was commented on very positively as well in the fact that um, one participant said that they felt Caroline was quite a positive role model and really helped change their perceptions of what it means to be autistic. So going from, you know, I, I've always felt like this really negative, you know, in a really negative, awful position, but actually I now appreciate I'm different. I've got lots of strengths and that's who I am. And it made people more aware of themselves in a much more positive way. Um, so that was the first theme. I don't know, Caroline, if there's anything you wanted to add there. Not really. I mean, that's, that's, you know, personally very flattering and nice, but, but I also think it's sort of absurd. The, it, it, it's like a man leading a woman's group, you know, having a person who identifies as not autistic, even though a lot of these people in fact are autistic, which is very difficult. So, you know, I understand that people might be in a position where they're autistic and they don't feel comfortable coming out, but that's not a situation that I think is helpful for running this particular sort of group. Um, and if, yeah, so it, so I, I, um, I suppose that just um, coheres, there's a better word, but I can't think of it, with what, I, with, with, with what I think that, yeah, that having autistic person running it is important. And I'm glad to hear that, you know, it, came out from other people independently when I wasn't there looking over their shoulder <laughs> telling them um, yeah so nothing else to say really yeah and I should just mention there as well that obviously Caroline was involved in the research and the participants were very aware of that um, but we did make it very clear around what information um, Caroline would and wouldn't have access to and made sure everyone was very comfortable with that and the thing that was encouraging participants, um, you know, who took part in the program and took part in the research, they weren't afraid to say, you know, if they thought there were aspects that could be improved. So it wasn't that it was, you know, a universally positive evaluation. People were, they, they had some really insightful feedback around aspects that perhaps could have been changed in future. And what was really nice as well was even from, when I evaluated iteration one to iteration two, which wasn't a huge amount of time between them, Caroline had taken that feedback from iteration one and had applied it for iteration two as well. And as I've been evaluating more and more, you can really see how Caroline's taken on board and implemented and acted on the feedback from everyone taking part. Um, but they very much weren't just saying Caroline was great because she was involved. They really, really did appreciate um, Caroline's skills that she, you know, shared with the group. Um, I move on to theme two, which was the theme that we termed unity in diversity. Um, and this was around the fact that the people who took part in the group really appreciated not just having an autistic facilitator, but also having a group of autistic peers. And while everyone was connected around the fact that they were autistic or thought they might be autistic, um, 
actually there was a lot of diversity um, within that group and that was in lots of different ways so in terms of um, gender diversity um, in terms of age in terms of different life histories um, you know families jobs interests and so on um, and people really really liked that um, one of um, our participants said, you know, if you just had 10 other people like me in a room, we wouldn't learn anything. So actually that diversity was really important. And it was particularly important, it seemed, for people who had quite limited experience of meeting other autistic people. Um, many people said, you know, you could read all about autism in a book, but actually when you're sitting in the room, someone termed it an epiphany. Um, people were also at very different stages of their journeys. So some had got their diagnosis a while ago, like Caroline mentioned, others quite recently, others self-identified and were deciding whether or not to pursue a diagnosis. And actually people liked the fact they were all at different stages and could share things with one another and learn from one another. Um, but what was really nice was that even though there was all of this diversity, the term that came up quite a lot was a kind of sense of belonging. Um, and I think people felt that their experiences were kind of being validated and legitimized. You know, it's not just you having these difficulties, actually, you know, lots of other people have experienced that. It's not that you are, you know, a bad person. It's not that you're doing something wrong. You know, there was just this kind of shared connection and it was really kind of, an important step in people's journeys from kind of hearing lots of negative information about autism or it being conveyed to them to more acceptance and understanding. Um, and people spoke a lot about how they just didn't have that sense of acceptance and understanding in some other groups that they'd been part of. Um, and some felt that this was particularly important because they felt a little bit socially isolated, you know, sometimes having difficulties with friends and family. Um, we definitely saw this in some of our earlier work on diagnosis as well, where some people were struggling to go down the diagnostic pathway or to access a diagnosis because their families might not have agreed with them pursuing a diagnosis, for example. And this group was a kind of space where everyone could kind of come together and just understood one another, um, which was really, really nice. Um, I think something that really helped with this as well, there was lots of kind of small group work, which is something that's translated into the breakout rooms in the online format as well. Um, and it was a nice way that people got to share some quite personal experiences um, with one another, complementing that with the more structured autism knowledge and information that Caroline was imparting as well. So I'm going to pass to you, Caroline, in case you had anything, but don't feel you have to. Um... So just to say that in the small group, that there are quite a few little sort of worksheets. Uh, it's fine if people don't keep to them, but, uh, but a thing I think that adds to the safety is that um, that there is a structure for all of the bits, including, except for, there was always a break, but people also mentioned, I don't know if they mentioned to you, but they definitely mentioned in the group itself that they felt free to like go outside, like if they couldn't cope, which some of them couldn't, even though they liked the group and they liked the people, like two hours was too long to be with people and they just go outside for 10 minutes and they felt that that was acceptable there where it wasn't otherwise. So, um, yeah, so there was, so as well as sort of, um, uh, dab, what did you call it? Diversity in? Unity in Unity in diversity. There was sort of a freedom in structure. <laughs> um, yeah. That came up in the online um, iterations as well. We've not actually had a chance to discuss this fully because I'm still in the middle of the evaluation at the moment, but definitely in terms of the Zoom format as well, people saying that it was fine to just turn off my camera if I wanted to and take some time away. And even in the breaks, there was the opportunity if you wanted to have your camera on, but you didn't have to. It was just, yeah, and it's, it's all of those little things that I think add to that feeling of safety, as you say. 
Um, and then all of that together, I think the kind of the feeling safe um, and the unity and diversity and having an autistic facilitator um, also fed into our third theme, which we call developing a positive and practical outlook on autism. And the thing that really came through here, um, because the course is peer support as well as psychoeducation, they were able to use all of this information. So the information that Caroline had shared, the kind of more structured information, but also the experiences um, from their peers within the program um, to make a real difference to their day-to-day -day life. And I think part of that was just in terms of how people kind of view themselves and the world around them. Um, also kind of better understanding some of the difficult aspects. I know I think there's a, a session on executive function, for example, um, but also kind of empowering people to speak to others as well about what being autistic means to them. Um, I think another thing um, that kind of came up with this as well was there was lots of examples given about how, you know, I've had this difficult situation at work and, um, you know, someone's playing their music really, really loud or things like this. And I feel much more confident now, not even by saying, you know, I'm autistic, but just having the kind of advocacy skills to be able to stand up for myself and to explain what my needs are um, and seeing those kind of positive aspects play out in their daily life um, was really nice. And we didn't specifically evaluate, um, you know, did this impact on mental health? And it's difficult to kind of see what's kind of causal or correlational, for example, but something that many people spoke about was the fact that lots of the practical solutions that they got from the program did seem to help with addressing some of the mental health problems that they were experiencing and particularly around anxiety. Um, so, one participant spoke about just, you know, feeling really off and often they, they just spend a lot of time kind of worrying about the situation, but they reflected back to the group and were able to use some of the strategies that they'd learned to remove some of the stress that was in that kind of in that situation. So really being able to take some concrete things from the program and implement them in daily life and a real sense from our participants that this could help with you know, the mental health challenges, lots of people spoke about kind of workplace um, difficulties they've been having and how to apply things there. And in terms of um, kind of feedback as well, one of the things that people spoke about, you know, this was just a 10 week program and actually, in a sense, I think the biggest um, kind of criticism was that they wanted more. Um, so it did have an ending um, and actually lots of people, particularly from the, the iteration I've been, um, where I've been speaking to people recently, they've spoken about the fact that, you know, it did seem to be the right place to stop. And I know Caroline does provide some, um, you know, additional sessions via Alt Angel that people can attend. So not just with those same people, but with a much broader range of people across different iterations or who have involvement with Alt Angel. Um, but it's been really interesting seeing what's been happening to each of the groups as they've gone on. So often there's been a kind of sense that they do want to try and keep in touch, but some of the logistics of organising that can be quite difficult. Often it relies on, you know, one person to take the lead and to set something up. And I don't want to talk too much about the kind of current iteration because in just in case someone on the who I'm going to speak to soon is about to um, is kind of on the call and might see what others have said but I think there was definitely a sense that without the structure that was there originally it could actually be quite difficult to kind of keep that connection there um, so I think there was sometimes some struggles about what this or I think people were a bit unsure actually about what they wanted at the end perhaps um, and we're trying different things out um, and it would be interesting I don't know if some of the kind of earlier groups have still kept in touch um, but certainly there was a sense about wanting a continuation of some sort 
um, but really lots of very, very positive experiences. And something that also was mentioned a lot um, was the fact that many people who took part in this programme really wanted other people um, who were diagnosed as autistic or who thought they might be autistic or um, you know identified as autistic to have the opportunity to be involved in this program they really wanted to see it expanded have it in many more places um, and said it would be a real shame if they couldn't do that so I think that's a real testament to the program that Caroline has developed. Well thank you that's very nice. That was fantastic. That was really, really interesting hearing about that. I'm just going to quickly let kind of you and Damien know my Wi-Fi is a bit AWOL at the moment. So if I disappear, it's not personal. My Wi-Fi is struggling a bit and hopefully Damien will chip in when I when my Wi-Fi starts to disappear a bit. So we've had quite a few questions through. I wonder if it's worth us starting to kind of have a discussion about some of the ideas that other people have thrown into the chat. Would that be okay with you? So I guess the first one that popped in. So we have, did you find that people who either suspected or did have a diagnosis coped in a group setting? The only, we've had a few people who've left due to anxiety basically which has been really sad because some of those people, at least the ones I can bring to mind, definitely benefited, felt they benefited, but just couldn't hack that situation. And I think, you know, you, you could play it safe and maybe not let in people who you thought might not be, but, but on the other hand, people really benefit. You, you can't tell until the time it happens, whether you're gonna be able to hack it or not. And um, so I, it was, I was sad for those people and maybe they can do it later, but mostly people who had not been able to cope with group situations felt that this was the one group where they felt able to cope. I think that probably would be reflected in the feedback, would it, Laura? Yeah, and I think actually some of the um, information that we've collected from the online programme feeds into that as well because some people spoke about the fact that they would have really struggled in a face-to-face -face situation because that takes a lot out of them to have to go to a different place and to be around people and to have the stresses of, you know, that little bit before a group starts where there's kind of an expectation that you'll chat to other people and, you know, at the breaks, there may be, you know, not being somewhere that you can go, even though Caroline did a lot to make it really accessible um, to many people. But they spoke about how, you know, the group situation would have been difficult, but actually having it online just took a lot of the additional strain away from them so that they felt they could concentrate in a group setting in a place they were comfortable, where they could always, you know, turn off their camera if they needed and be in their own space. So I think maybe, you know, obviously it's still a group situation, um, but that I think helped for a lot of people who perhaps wouldn't have been able to access the face-to-face -face one. Definitely, definitely. So I guess, I guess you kind of talked a little bit around this, but I guess someone's asked what makes the programme different to a help self-help group? It might be well, good to hear a bit about that. Well, I mean, it, it is quite, highly facilitated. <laughs> I think people sometimes don't realize, um, but um, yeah, so a self-help group, you, you would share the responsibility for that group. Whereas here, the responsibility for ensuring, you know, that, that the group runs and that there's content and everything lies with the facilitator, which in, in this case is me. And I, I just think that's quite, um, I mean, it is, you know, bits of it are self-help in that it's a peer support group. So it's really a mixture, but, but and the self-help bits, as I, as I was saying before, with the sort of um, freedom in structure idea is the self-help bits are just like quite structured little aspects of the whole. So people are going into little groups or online into breakout rooms with each other. 
and discussing something, but it's in a, it, but it's still got that structure. Um, and they, they don't have to take any responsibility for that. Whereas I would say in a self-help group, you know, you sort of do. Scrap the sort of, you do. Yeah. <laughs> so someone has said they read a lot for work and they've noticed free autism related or sort of autism related issues. It makes it difficult to remember what they've read. Um, is there a better way to use their memory? Um, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. I don't, as an autistic person, I don't know either. Damien, do you have any input? Having a look at the message. Um... I think the thing is not to, I mean, I'm halfway through so the message, but I think you can't believe everything you read is <laughs> part of it. And memorising information can be uh, difficult and problematic for certain types of information and how much information you can hold in your mind at any one time, um, especially if... Uh, not being distracted by people, I guess. Um, so my working memory is rather good if I'm not distracted and interrupted. The problem is I'm highly sensory sensitive, so I'm always being interrupted <laughs> and losing my train of thought. So um, if I'm in a calm environment, I can hold quite a lot of information. Um, I'm quite lucky in that way. Uh, other autistic people I know holding on to information is really difficult, even if it's really interesting and salient. And so, so an episodic memory has often been said to be an issue. So placing oneself in context within memories and stories and so on, uh, a lot of people have issues with, whilst I have a, uh, like good head for numbers like what Linford Christie was running time was in 1996 or, you know, <laughs> I have this weird head for numbers at times but what I did last week as opposed to last month gets a bit mixed up so I guess practical things um, are going to be quite personal to as memory aids if you're um, might be post-it notes or reminders or um, but it can be difficult you can forget to set your reminders and things like that <laughs> um, and so cutting down on the load if at all possible so one thing at a time would be my ideal it just never seems possible in reality um, <laughs> this kind of thing but uh, and a bit of understanding from the people you're around that you might struggle to hang on to information. This is part of the issue. We put all the pressure on ourselves to do things and it, sometimes we just need a bit of understanding and those who we're working with a bit of leeway. There's a question actually that I also wanted to ask you both, Caroline and Laura, as well. Is there anything similar for people who just couldn't do the group sessions or the group sessions didn't quite work for them? Um, I mean, I personally offer individual consultations, but it's not really like that because that's educational. So I, that, that would go much more with what the particular person at that particular time wanted to talk about. So I wouldn't say that's a replacement. I, I don't think there is. I mean, I think it would be possible perhaps to do like, to create something, but it would be quite a lot of work. So to create the, the talks, but part of the, the, 
what people do in breakout rooms, which often there are worksheets that they're doing together with other people, but the benefit is in the sharing, is like sharing those strategies or sharing those experiences. So I don't think you could, you know, that you, you, you can't replicate that individually, really. Yeah, I think this program perhaps isn't a program that everyone would necessarily benefit from. You know, I don't think there's anything, no matter kind of what the situation is, you will never find it something that benefits, you know, every single person pretty much. But I think the, the beauty of this program is that it is something that does seem to benefit, you know, a group of people. And for some people who took part, this wasn't the only thing that they'd ha had access to. So it might have been some, you know, one-to-one -one therapy sessions to be able to kind of go in a bit more depth with some of the aspects that, you know, they've encountered in daily life. But certainly from the majority of the people that we have spoken to, this was, you know, really, really helpful step in their journey. And it might be that they go on to something else in future, you know, some other programs, some other one-to-one -one sessions or seek some other kind of help, support or guidance. Um, you know, I said it's not a panacea, but it, it does seem to be, you know, for a group of people at a particular time, really, really positive. Definitely. Yeah. I think I'll let you go first, Caroline. Well, no, it's just I agree with Laura. You know, there's yeah. not going to be one thing that suits everybody, especially not autistic everybody, because mm -hmm. we're such a diverse population. So um, it, it, it would be something different. And, and I suppose the, the relevant bit there is that there are aspects of this that are very group, are very about comparison and sharing. Yeah, I was just also going to echo that we are just also different and it's so good that this that such good results have come out of this very small group I think it's really really positive and I guess one thing I found when reading it um, was the importance of belonging as well and the interaction and mutual rapport because it's certainly something that I'm finding in my PhD research and I know other people have found in recent things as well so I think it's I think it's just fantastic that there's more to kind of support report and I think Damien's got his hand up. <laughs> yeah, I was just thinking about a, an important difference in dynamic with the more one-to-one -one, uh, support like mentoring that I've done projects with in the past and so on and mentoring certainly has its place but there's a lack of that mirror, mirroring socially in a, in a group on a wider basis than one-to-one. -one. And so uh, looking at the similarities and differences with the other members of the group, because there will be some similarities then as well as this diversity. And that's always interesting and uh, adds to one's own sense of selfhood and place in the world. And I think group activities do add something that the one-to-one -one type of support doesn't. Um, I think this, there's evidence of that here in this project and analysis. Uh, it's interesting as well to have that highlighted. Um, yeah. And yeah, it's not for everyone and it can be difficult group activities and situations, but um, that kind of aha moment, I think someone called it earlier, in autistic spaces is a very powerful one and a very important one um, in people's accounts. I'm going to have a little plug as well for Caroline's book, um, which has, I, it's not the same as the kind of, you know, hearing from other people, but I think it's brilliant. Yep, being autistic. So nine hours to share their journey from diagnosis to acceptance. And it's really nice to see, ju yeah, just the variety of different routes that people can take on this journey and seeing some commonalities, but also some differences. And I think, you know, perhaps if the group um, 
isn't right for someone or not right for them at this moment in time, I think that book can be a helpful starting point, particularly for people who are thinking that they might be autistic um, and seeing some of the diversity across the chapters there as well. A, a thing I'd like to say, actually, um, I, I just thought I need to say it now because I'll forget, is that what is frustrating is that the, the work of Laura, like the evaluation I think has helped us get funding to, to run it again. But at the moment, I'm, we basically need to be training more people to facilitate that. And we found it impossible to get funding to do that. And it just strikes me as crazy, essentially, when the health service is so overburdened and people don't, you know, Autangel gets regularly requests from community mental health teams asking about, you know, uh, this autistic person, that autistic person, can we refer you them to you? And we don't have, they, they don't fund us. And so I just sort of putting out a plea in case anybody on this call knows any way of which we could get funding to train more people to facilitate this course, which has good evidence, really helps people. Um, and it, it just, it, it's just such a shame that that isn't the that currently that doesn't seem to be um, a top priority out there. Complete, completely, completely agree. I think there's the political side um, and with the NHS practically and so on, there is some investment going in at the moment for main, making healthcare more accessible and better for autistic people and so on. But, some work in sensory issues, things like that. But there's some talk around preventative strategies. So, so much of what service provision is, is crisis management. And there needs to be research and practice around the prevention of people hitting crisis in the first place. Yeah. It's far more social uh, practical provisions that we need and and research like this is helpful um, but we need more funding and more political will um, community centers one-stop shops these kind of practical measures where you can hold mentoring one-to-one -one sessions peer support groups activities and provide a variety of things to try and meet people's needs. Um, but yeah, thinking a bit idealistically, <laughs> but there is at least some well, yeah, momentum, well, I think, in like NHS and things like that to actually do something about some of these issues. I think the other problem is that then they try and get a one size fits all. So as Laura says, I, much as I think, obviously, I believe in this program and I would like to see it expanded and more people. Try, I don't think it is the answer. You know, I don't think there should be this one thing. There needs to be a lot of support for people developing things that fit in different contexts. Right. Well, I'd agree with you. It's not going to work to have one yeah, model. Yeah. No, I mean, I mean, it's true. We're just talking ideals here, which mm. is, you know, uh, of limited. I've, I've got one final question that's come through. And the last one is, what were the strategies discussed based on, i.e. were they CBD based or were they based on something else? People's experience, actually. You know, so it, it was none of it was based on a, some external theory that was there. It was like, for me, I just had a lot of background knowledge and information and read a lot and what worked in my life. And then I wove in what worked in other people's lives. And then as Laura said a lot, people talked to each other and helped each other with strategies. So it was very much people figuring it out rather than, yeah, we'll take this CBT, et cetera, which actually, doesn't work for a lot of people. I think the other thing that, and you know, I didn't attend the sessions, but this is just from what people were telling me. It was just one of the first times that people had heard about autism and it not being framed from a kind of tragedy narrative. 
it was just a you know I, the sense came through of you know I'm not a bad person and I know that now and it's just quite a sad situation that that's how many people had come into the program and um, so I think having that really kind of positive practical outlook and that's not to say that Caroline you know doesn't pay attention to some of the challenges that you can experience as a result of being autistic but it was the framing around that that I think many many people benefited from as well. I think that I've found that a lot as well in training around autism uh, this kind of thing it's often very much appreciated if it's autistic then what well, it brings topics to life if you can talk about the personal experiences and it's far more respectful um, in its delivery and doesn't shirk the problems it's and make it all fluffy it's about being respectful um, and so I think it doesn't surprise me that finding at all really <laughs> that such leadership in a sense makes sense and why it works. So if it's okay everyone I think it's about time to yeah. wrap up the call here. Thank you so much to Caroline and Laura for joining us and for sharing not only Caroline's programme but also the evaluation as well it's been really insightful in the conversation I think it's been food for thought for a lot of people and it's been we great need more and, um, of this kind of thing well it doesn't have to be the exact <laughs> model but it needs yeah. more of this kind of collaborative approach and helping one another yeah and, and we will researchers too so yeah thanks to Laura yeah <laughs> And we will be having another, we'll be redoing starting in these kind of general sessions, club sessions back up in September. Um, so keep an eye on Facebook and Twitter and we'll, we haven't got a date agreed for the next one, but we, we will be posting when we know. And any ideas to send them in to us. Yeah. And uh, we'll take feedback on board with yeah. how we move forward. Definitely. So I will say bye everyone Thank and you. hope you have a good evening. And my cat says bye as well because he's screaming in the corner for food. <laughs> I'll see you all later. I hope you've enjoyed the session.